Thank you very much. And it's the, it's the first time I have a robot in the audience. So that's, that's really cool. OK, so uh, since today is September 14th, is it? Yeah, OK. Um, I thought that it would be a nice thing to start with this, which is uh, the origin of uh, gravitational wave astronomy. So actually, this is the original email that we got six years ago from uh, one of uh, our colleagues at Max Planck Institute in Germany uh, telling, uh, telling the collaboration that there was an interesting event. And uh, uh, Marco, his name is Marco as well, uh, he is Italian like me. And uh, being in Germany, he was awake at the time we had the detection. We were all be sleeping. So we wake up in the morning and we found this email. And uh, one interesting thing that I'd like to point out is this one. The event, it is not flagged as a hardware injection. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit in my talk what all this means. As we understand after some fast investigation, someone can, someone can confirm that it is not a hardware injection. So it's not a fake signal in the detector. And, uh, and then if I look at my inbox in the next few hours, I had about 200 emails discussing about this. And uh, because uh, we were, people were really afraid that, that it could have been a fake signal put into the detector to test the efficiency of the pipeline. Now, at that time, uh, I, was, uh, uh, I was assistant spokesperson of the collaboration. And uh, well, I knew, I and a couple of other people knew that it could not have been a fake signal. Why? Because we were strict, still struggling to set up the pipeline <laughs> for fake signals, right? <laughs> so there were uh, 500 people in the collaboration discussing, wondering, and we could not say, <laughs> right? But we knew that it was not a fake signal. So. Um, those were exciting times. OK, so uh, let's see if I can. Uh, OK, so let, let's, let's start the real talk. So this is the title I, I gave uh, uh, Christian some time ago. But I decided to change it into the meaning of gravitational wave astronomy. And maybe uh, you may get some reference to some movie along the way. OK, so we'll start with, uh, let's start with this. I showed it yesterday, right? Um, this is the, so the abstract of the last catalog of gravitational waves. There is one uh, coming out very soon. But so far, we have published 50 confident detections of gravitational waves. 39 in this uh, latest catalog and 11 in the, in the previous, uh, previous versions of the catalog. And as I said yesterday, we can do a lot of physics, right? We can measure masses, we can measure spins, we can measure uh, even the uh, Hubble constant. Uh, a lot, we can do a lot. Now, my goal in the next hour or so is walk you through the detector and uh, um, so you can, uh, you know, you, you can see how complicated it is to get to that abstract, OK? And this I also showed it yesterday. This is a typical day in LIGO. There are a lot of things going on. There is a lot of noise we have to fight. And, uh, the, but there is also a lot of interesting physics uh, in, this, in this plot. So let's start with. Uh, I said yesterday how you make the sausage, right? This is the process that you use to make the sausage to get to the final result. This is the pipeline that takes you to the instruments to the final product, which is the catalog. And I'm going to walk you through um, not all of this, 
because some of these parts will be dealt with in the next tutorials. But at least the first part, which is what you have to do to get data that, are, that allow you even to do, you know, to do the physics, right? So we're going to walk through all these stages starting from, from the detector. So we start with, uh, okay, part one, the miracle of LIGO. And uh, I'm going mainly to talk about the LIGO interferometers, the LIGO detectors, because I'm in the LIGO scientific collaboration. I'm more familiar with the LIGO detectors. But I have to say that apart from technical differences in the instruments, uh, all the procedure to clean the data, uh, work with the data, do the astrophysical analysis and so on is a joint endeavor between LIGO and Virgo, right? So when we, we work together, we do the analysis, we don't even remember who is LIGO and who is Virgo. Everything is together. But for the, the instruments have some difference, technical difference, so I will focus more on, uh, on LIGO. Okay, so this is, uh, um, is an animated tour of LIGO. I'm not going to play it here, it takes a, a few minutes, but uh, there is the link there, it's public on Vimeo, and you can see it's a nice animation that we did for the public that tells you a little bit how, how it works. What I'm going to do is really go in a, a little bit more in uh, detail and go over the main components of the instrument first. And then um, I'll show you, once you get the data, what uh, uh, you have to do to make them usable, okay? And uh, please uh, ask questions all the time, also because uh, uh, Sometimes I have people in the audience sleeping because I'm too boring. Sometimes I sleep on my talks, right? So you have to ask me questions to wake me up, right? So, okay. So this is the, uh, the layout of the LIGO interferometer. And uh, how does it work? Okay, so I have to find a way of doing that faster. So let's start with the first component, which is the laser. So this is a laser interferometer. Um, the idea is very simple. It's, this instrument is a ruler, measures distances, right? They are actually two rulers at 40 degrees. When the gravitational wave passes by, as you know, uh, it produces a strain in this detector, and then if you have a laser, you can use the interference of the laser to measure the, the effect. Okay, so the laser is the first component of the instrument and, okay. So the laser is a state-of-the-art laser, is a solid-state uh, laser, continuous laser. It works in the infrared, so it's uh, 10, uh, uh, 1066 nanometers and it's a continuous laser. It can produce an output of 180 watts. We haven't used it yet at such high power. And the reason is that uh, the, the more uh, you go up with power, the more you excite uh, some parameter instabilities. So, so far we have used it uh, around 40 watts of power. But in principle, it can go much higher. Of course, um, there are trade-offs between uh, using a low power and a high power. Um, if you know a little bit of, you know, quantum optics and so on, you know that uh, the higher you go with the power laser, the more shot noise you produce and uh, the more uh, laser pressure you produce. So it's, it's a trade-off. So the, we have this laser that is pre-stabilized. Uh, yes? So what is all the benefit of higher power? So the other, uh, the, the higher the power, the more stable is the laser, right? Because you are more photons, right? And also, the, that's actually, there are no stupid questions, but there are stupid answers. So I hope I won't give you one. <laughs> um, so what we do, actually, the, the, way, the way it works is, um, if you have a small interferometer, 
you look you and you simply look at the fringes, right? You see on and off fringes, dark and bright. This is not actually what we do here, right? What we do here is to measure the fluctuations, right? The corrections to the fluctuations that you have to apply, right? So the more photons you have, the smaller are these fluctuations because it's a, it's a Poissonian statistics, right? It goes like one over square root of n. So the more photons you have, the small is the fluctuation and of course, the more you can see the, the effect, right? Of course, there are, as I said, there are trade-offs. If you are, you know, because you are going to, to create more pressure radiation, you have to create more, uh, you create more shot noise and so on. So what exactly is the shot noise? Shot noise, so uh, think of the laser about photons, right, heating. Uh, the rate of photons is on average constant, right? You have one photon per second, let's say, right? But it's not actually uh, constant. So at a certain point you have more photons, at a certain point you have less photons. That makes, you know, your background change. So what, what determines this? Uh -huh. What determines this noise? Is this oh, it's the laser. It's, it's the quantum the nature of the laser, right? So, uh, I mean, it's because they are photons. So it is limited by the quantum... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the quantum noise. Yeah. Right. And on the other... And that's um, important at high frequencies. Is it not the case that if you have more power, you have more... creeps in the fabric of the Yeah, they, it's uh, all... Everything is, is, is related together. Um, okay. There's so, a question from oh, there is a question. Oh, I see the hand. Yes. Uh, so, hi. Uh, my question is: Is there any particular reason to use uh, this uh, laser only? I mean, at this wavelength only? Um, so, it's yeah. It's the. So we'll see that there are mirrors, and they are mirrors with coating, right? So this is, uh, well, first of all, you can make a very stable laser with the, at, the, uh, with, at this wavelength and so on. And also it's important because of the coating, right? So you can make very good coating at this, uh, um, uh, at this wavelength, right? So that's, that's the main reason why you can uh, you, you use this. And these are, you know, it's not really a commercial laser. It has been designed for, for this, but it's a well-known technology for continuous lasers. So there are, there are studies of looking at different laser wavelengths, right? And uh, I think the Kagra detector uses a different uh, uh, wavelength. Um, but then you're going to end up with different problems for the, for the mirrors. You have to change the substrate. You have to change the coating and so on. So at the beginning, it was... Uh, um, it was there, there were studies to use, for example, different wavelengths, but then this is what we uh, settled down. Okay, uh, so I'm not going to go through all uh, all the details anyway. It's everything is recorded, and I put references there at the bottom if you want to know, uh, know more. This is actually the uh, the laser. I think that's the laser in uh, uh, in Livingston, and. Uh, you see here there is the periscope, the light of the laser, then it's sent out to the, uh, to the interferometer. Um, the second uh, important component of the instrument is what we call the input mode cleaner. So the input mode cleaner has uh, several functions. So first of all, uh, you have to remove the higher modes that come out from, from the laser. And then you have, to stabilize, you have to stabilize the laser. And you have to increase the beam size. Why? Because uh, in order to uh, lower the noise, you want the laser beam to be as big as possible. Right? So the, all the fluctuations of the laser, they get spread out on a bigger area. Uh, think about it. We are trying to measure, we are measuring uh, displacements of the order of 10 to the uh, minus 18 meters, right? So this is well below the, uh, the size of, uh, of a proton. So the way you do that is because these fluctuations, you average on a big area, right? 
So the uh, laser light is transformed, right, from a small beam to a beam which is, I think, about five, six centimeters, we'll see later. And it, that's what enters in the interferon. So there are other uh, reasons why we have the input more cleaner, right? And so one is reduce the higher order modes, so it, it, we get only the fundamental mo mode. Uh, we use it uh, to, as a control. We inject some modulations that will be used to lock the interferometer. And uh, um, so essentially when the laser beam comes out of the, uh, of the input mode cleaner, pre mode cleaner, and then the input mode cleaner is, uh, is made, uh, is stabilized. So the first part is the pre-mode cleaner, and then the second, which is a bow tie cavity, and then the, the second part uh, is uh, the, really the uh, input mode cleaner. So all these optics uh, are all suspended because you have to uh, minimize the jitter, minimize the noise, uh, you had to make sure that you don't send laser, laser light back to the laser, so you have uh, um, uh, a, um, um, a Faraday isolator, right? As I said before, you put modulation sidebands that you will use to control the interferometer. And uh, all these optics, right, they have very high finesse, right? So um, you they are highly reflected optics, all suspended. These are suspended uh, usually with uh, um, steel, steel wires. And uh, um, as I said, when the, inter the light of the interferometer exits, the input mode cleaner is ready to be uh, uh, is stable for the, for the interferometer. So this is on a vibration isolation table yeah. already? All but the this... laser itself is not? Hmm? The laser itself is not. The laser is not. Yeah, so, the laser is just not. Yeah. Is it not because, because that no, because uh, because we have uh, we have the input mode cleaner that exactly removes any jitter. What exactly is jitter? Jitter is vi vibrations vibrations in the in the beam, right? So, uh, yeah. Okay. So then, uh, after we have the beam prepared, the beam is sent into the interferometer. So interferometer is a modified Michelson, so you have, we have the beam splitter and the two arms. But before, we have uh, an optic here that is called the power recycling cavity. And uh, essentially builds, uh, it takes the light that will go back towards the laser and recycles it. Um, so it, uh, this optic here is, a, uh, is an optic that is uh, uh, highly reflecting, reflecting on this side, right? So I will think I have some parameters here. And uh, it's used to recycle, send the light back into the interferometer, right? Um, all these components, right, from, uh, from the input mode cleaner on, they are in vacuum. They are housed in, in vacuum. Um, and uh, uh, so the, by recycling the light of the interferometer, you can increase the power, right, effect, the effective power that is uh, uh, input in the, uh, into the interferometer. So I have a question because yes. you said you're not using the maximum power of the laser, but now you're... Using this, what's the why? Uh... Because okay, because the maximum power of the laser, right, is uh, so the laser is stabilized, but it's the laser that produces the quantum noise, right? Here I'm recycling the light in resonance, which is already being stabilized. Well, by this the... quantum noise has been removed, right? And at this point, the beam, right, the beam is. Uh, five centimeters, so all the noise is washed out because, uh, because of, you know, averaging on, on, on the area. Um, right, so this, for example, is, the, uh, is a picture of the um, a power recycling mirror that is um, um, that it's in, the, in the power recycling uh, cavity. 
Then the main part of the interferometers are the two arms with the core optics, okay? So, uh, Michelson modified by these cavities here that again increase the power and essentially increase the effective length of uh, the interferometer by about a factor of 100. This is what Berberis said yesterday, right? So, again, these optics here is highly reflective on this side, right? The finesse, uh, we'll see the parameters, but it's about uh, uh, one uh, percent, uh, you know, 99% reflective on this side, right? So, it, uh, this light bounces essentially back and forth, if you think of the light as a, as a, as a classical way for about 100 times, and increases the power that it's stored in the arms uh, up to several kilo, kilowatts, okay? What is this finesse? What is the definition of finesse? I'll think it's in the next slide. Here it is, okay. So, the finesse is defined, uh, so you have, uh, um, you have the, the light with a spectrum, right? So frequency versus amplitude. These, you are, remember that here essentially you have only one mode, right? So you have essentially a peak. All this light is uh, at, the, at the light frequency. The finesse is uh, the, and then you have uh, extra higher order modes that are suppressed. The finesse is essentially the distance between the various modes normalized to the width of the resonance, right? So you want to keep this higher mode as far as you can from the carrier of, of the light, right? And uh, so it's uh, how narrow are the resonances, right, compared to their, their distance. And this is related to the reflectivity of, of the mirrors, right? Yeah. Uh, sorry, you said that uh, this thing about the reflecting mirrors is to increase the power. Mm -hmm. uh, is, it, is it also to increase the optical length of the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Essentially, it's like increasing the optical length by a factor 100 or okay. whatever. Yeah. To, to see right. being better than... So, effectively, this, is, this instrument is not 4 kilometers, but it's uh, 4 times 100. 4 ta uh, 400 kilometers, right, something like that. And uh, if you remember what, uh, uh, what Barry said yesterday, um, you can't go too much over that, right? Because you want, so when you do the computation of the, you know, of the strain, you are assuming that the wavelength of the gravitational wave is larger than, much longer than the size of the arms, right? So you don't want to go too much high because otherwise, uh, you, you know, the H is not exactly what, what you measure. But that's the idea. So, so, so yeah. Sorry about this Phoenix thing. So, so you're saying resonances, but what exactly do you mean resonances here? So, so you have some kind of peak, uh, sharp peak for the central wavelengths. That's, that's right. That's what right. are the resonances that's coming from the... Uh, other modes of the laser? Or? Yeah, other modes of the laser, because you, you clean the modes, right? But you don't clean them completely, right? And so how, how does, the, also, what does it have to do with the reflectivity of the mirrors? Because also, uh, also you, uh, we insert some modulations in the, in the, in the laser, right? To, to do the locking, right? Um, the, so if the, the finesse is related to the length of the optical cavity, right? And the length of the optical cavity is, reflect, is, is uh, related to the reflectivity and the, uh, and the curvature of the mirrors, right? I don't think I put, I put the equations there, but... Um, okay, so, uh, so the mirror, so... The, the two arms uh, are a Fabry Perot cavity resonator because you have the end mirror and the initial mirror. They are slightly curved and uh, uh, to, you know, to focus, to focus the light. Uh, the reflectivity is written there. As I said, uh, they are the end uh, mirror. We, you want it as much reflective as you can. And indeed, the transmission is only five parts per million for the final, for the, what we call the N-test mass. And uh, this one has a reflectivity of about 99%, which in increases the optical length, as we said before. 
Okay, um, all these uh, mirrors are suspended in a, in a very complicated uh, uh, in a very complicated way that we'll see in a moment. Just answer the question. Yes. Yeah. These are Gaussian beams between the mirrors. Yes. Or, or yeah. One, is this some kind of optimization that one chooses Gaussian beams because the choose other ones, right? So. Yeah, because you want. Or, yeah. No, they are simply Gaussian uh, Ga Gaussian beams. Yeah. And so is this with, uh, is this still by the curvature of the mirrors or something like that? Or right. Or uh, yes. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. So the mirrors are actually not plain, but slightly slightly curved. Uh, it must be it's written. Parabolic. Somewhere. It's uh, what was the right shape, shape for a Gaussian? Hmm? Is this uh, spherical? Is it parabolic? It's or? spherical. You see, yeah, they are spherical. And the beam is slightly asymmetric, so these have uh, uh, slightly uh, different curvatures, right? Why is that? Why, why is that? Uh, that's a good question, and I'm not sure I know. Yeah. Um, yes, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, the radius of curvatures are are here essentially, right? So they are very slightly curved. Okay. Um, right. And uh, one one important thing that uh, um, to point out, right? is in the arms, the dominant noise is due to the coating, right? It's due to the thermal noise in the, in the coating, it's due uh, and uh, you know, the mechanical loss and, the, and all of that. Okay, so let's... Okay, so the core optics, um, as uh, you know, uh, Barry said yesterday, they are made of fused silica. Uh, there were studies to, in, uh, to use a different material, for example, sapphire. Kagar is using sapphire. Uh, this was a trade-off because it's also because of cost, so it's cheaper than, uh, uh, than sapphire. They are uh, uh, made uh, in France, and they are specially made uh, for, uh, uh, for LIGO. They have an incredible you know, um, precision, right? They are polished with uh, a precision of less than one nanometer, right? So the radius of curvature and the roughness of the mirrors. The coating, they are coated with uh, um, alternating layers of uh, the, that material. They are slightly coated, slightly different, depending if they are, they are entered test masses or input test masses because uh, of uh, the different uh, uh, reflectivity. There is a huge, um, a lot of study going on about coating. Uh, we have a coating group, we have a coating institute, and this is one of the main areas of research for the instrument. Uh, how to minimize thermal noise in the coating while preserving, you know, the qualities that you have to do. And I have to say that I'm really not an expert on that, but uh, it's, it's a huge deal. Uh, NSF funded a special program for coating research because uh, uh, thermal noise will be one of the limiting factors for the next generations of, uh, of interferometers. Um, now, suspensions, this is very interesting. So what you want is, th so these mirrors are test masses, right? So it's what couples to the gravitational wave to, uh, to do the measurement. They have a mass, so they couple to, cou they, they, they couple to, uh, to gravity. And you want them essentially to be in free fall. Now, you cannot put them in free fall, really in all three dimensions, but at least in two <laughs> dimensions you can. So you can, you suspend them, right, like pendula. Now, uh, this is one of the main sources of noise that you have uh, in the instrument, because by suspending them, you end up with, uh, you know, vibrational modes, violin modes, and uh, uh, any disturbance that comes from the environment will propagate to these mirrors. So you have to isolate it as much as, as you can. And uh, um, 
so actually the, 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 the suspension system produ produces uh, several orders of magnitude of isolation, for example, in the, in the low frequencies. Um, so this uh, also Barry mentioned it yesterday. So they, he called them a nice, nice uh, shock absorbers. And that's, uh, that is a good way to, uh, to say it. So this, you have these chambers, right? On top of the chambers, you have this system of blades. So this is a, what we call a quadruple, quadruple pendulum. So there are four stages, right? Uh, the first two stages are hang with steel wires, and they are these blades. And then you have four masses. So these pendula are double, right? There is, uh, this is the mirror that faces the interferometer. And on the back, uh, there is a mass uh, that is the reaction mass, which is what you use to control the mirror, right? So these things need to be kept on lock all the time. And then you add one stage to, you know, lower the, the, the frequency of, uh, of the pendulum, right? So this is a picture, right, of uh, essentially this cage. This is the, uh, the lower mass, right, before it was, uh, it was installed. Uh, the mirrors are 40 kilograms. You want to make them uh, as um, heavy as you can, compatible with the, with the technology you have to increase uh, the coupling with gravity. Um, how are they suspended? So, the last two stages are suspended through silica fibers. So these mirrors have uh, ears attached that uh, uh, they are being attached there, so they are fused. And then uh, uh, they are what we call monolithic suspension. So they have these fibers that are of the same material, and uh, they, have, they are very small, very small diameter, that attached, uh, attach the lower mass to the mass above, and then that goes to the, second, uh, to the second stage. They are all fused together to minimize the ter all the thermal effects. Um, I didn't put it here, but uh, there is a, we have a nice video that these fibers, uh, although they are, they are 400 uh, microns of diameter, they are extremely res uh, resistant, right? So, um, there is a small clip of uh, uh, one of our graduate students with a, with a hammer, right, with a mallet, hitting the mirror, not the good one, right, a dummy one, right? And, uh, uh, and these fibers do not break, right? So they, have, they are really stiff. But Virgo was delayed because of... Uh, uh, he, uh, yeah, I'm not going to comment on, Vir <laughs> on Virgo, but... Um, they are, uh, right, they have to be done, uh, so if you have the smallest impurity in this fabric, in, in these uh, fibers, that may be a problem, right? That's what, that's what happened. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see that everything is all right now. <laughs> um, because, for example, uh, the, these, these are in vacuum, and so that, that's fine, right? But if uh, in, uh, in air or with uh, just a little bit of humidity, they, they become really, um, um, yeah, brittle, right? So you, you had to touch them with your fingers, they go, right? But in vacuum, they, they are extremely resilient. Um, so the core optics, right? So the end test masses are suspended and the input test masses are suspended this way. The beam splitter and all other optics, they simply have steel wires. And in initial LIGO, all the optics add the steel wires. So this is an uh, was an advancement for advanced LIGO. Um, okay, so the seismic isolation. So this is the platform from where everything is suspended. Right, so the quad suspension that we saw before is here, and then it, this is the seismic iso isolate, is isolation that has several stages. Some of them are passive, a couple of us are passive stages, 
right? And some are controlled, uh, they are active and they are con controlled with a feed forward mechanism, right? So we have an array of seismometers and other sensors that uh, measure the vibration, then correct, uh, you know, for, for the vibra vibration. Um, and uh, yeah, this is an, uh, the other scheme of uh, the whole assembly together, right? So this is the arm of the interferometer, this is the mirror, the, uh, this is the reaction uh, mass, this is the second stage, the other two stage, and everything is uh, um, attached to the, to the seismic isolation structure. This one is the, is the part that is, uh, is uh, the hydraulic pre uh, external pre-isolator system that controls the feed uh, uh, forward. <laughs> How is the, the, this uh, reaction mass controlling the mirror? There are actuators, right? What is an actuator? Uh, um, yeah, magnets, right? So you, imp you input current and then you can, you can push the mirror slightly. So let's say yeah, like small magnets. Um, something that I am not, uh, I didn't put it, but then there is a thermal compensation system. So these, uh, um, these mirrors have rings that you can change the uh, use to control the temperature because when you have the laser light, the laser light is deforming the mirror. So you have to correct for the mirror. Um, it's extremely complicated. For example, we found that um, some source, some noise was caused by the residual gas between the test mass and the reaction mass, right? There is, of course, there is a little gap. And if you have a little bit of residual gas, it's going to bounce back and forth and give you a noise, right? So for example, uh, uh, the reaction mass was, uh, <laughs> essentially was drilled, right? So to allow, uh, you, you know, it, it's very complicated. Every time uh, there is some commissioning, and uh, these chambers are vented, uh, uh, there is something else that gets installed or gets changed. Uh, and why are these things, uh, would it not be better to have them hanging together rather than separately? Uh, this, uh... And the, the reaction mass with the other, no, you, you need the reaction mass to, uh, to, to, yeah, to, to be separate to control, uh, you know, to, to control. Because this one really has to be in free fall as much as, much as you can. Because what, what happens in the interferometer is that uh, um, you measure, right? Uh, so when a gravitational wave passes by, it, it, uh, it causes, a, uh, makes the, the interferometer goes slightly off, right? So you correct it. And what you measure is the correction that you apply to keep, to bring it back uh, to, the, to the state, right? So this is actually where, where you extract the, uh, the, the information. Um, I know all these things uh, are surrounded by an array of uh, instruments, size, ground seismometers, Seismometers on the stage, some of them are in vacuum systems, some of them are out, uh, magnetometers, everything that uh, um, is controlled. Then, uh, so you have the two arms, they are identical, then the light goes out, you have a signal recy recycling cavity, which essentially does the same job of the initial cavity, right? So it, uh, recycles some of this light. You can use also these to, you know, again, you remove some of the modes and you can give, you can use it to increase the sensitivity of the instrument at a certain frequencies. And... Uh, uh, so question, you yeah. mentioned the, the, the length of the arms uh, and they're identical. Obviously you're not going to be able to make them identical. Yeah, that's not. Is yeah. there a, a, an optimal configuration that should be as identical as possible? Does it matter? Does it not matter? Mm, uh, I mean, it's uh, of, of course uh, over four kilometers you cannot make them exactly identical. But it, once it's locked, is is I mean it doesn't matter, right? So, so uh, here 
difference of a few meters if I want to make a difference? No, there is not a difference of a few meters. I mean, there is a difference of uh, maybe a few millimeters, I would say, but, um, you know, they could be off by one wavelength. Right? Um, so signal recycling, recycling cavity, um, and uh, again, again uh, um, they are suspended optics. I'll, I'll go a little bit faster because there are a lot of things that I want to say. Um, then we have the Admon mode cleaner. The Admon mode cleaner is, uh, cleans uh, the final beam from all the spurious modes that you have accumulated in, in, the, in the instrument, and, and it's where you do the final measurement. Now, here you have to be very careful, because if you have a gravitational wave signal, it appears here already, because this is already the output of the interferometer. So, for example, uh, sensors from the output mode cleaner, they are usually not used, you know, to veto external disturbances because they may already contain the signal. And also you have to be careful because at this point, any noise that enters the interferometer remains in the data stream, right? You are at the, you are at the output port. So for example, the optical table, right? This is a very special optical table. Everything, all the optics are fused. The optical table is fused silica itself. And all the optics are, are fused together because you have to minimize all sorts of uh, jitter and vibrations that you have in the output cavity, right? And it's again a similar cavity that what, what you have uh, in, the, in the input mode cleaner that removes the higher, uh, the higher uh, order mo modes. And then finally, you, do, you have the readout system, okay? And the readout system, well, in principle, is just one, it's a photodiode, right? In, uh, in practice, it's a little bit more complicated. And one of the things that uh, uh, are being installed for the uh, later science run is a, a squeezer system, right? So the squeezer system is used to reduce the shot noise uh, at the output of the interferometer. The way um, there are some references there if you want to uh, look at the math and, uh, and so on. But the way it works is that, okay, let me backtrack a little bit. So in, uh, usually people say that uh, uh, the output of the interferometer is designed in a way that the output is in on a dark fringe, so you have no light. That's not completely true. The uh, interferometer is locked in a way that is a little bit offset, right? And uh, from, uh, from the, dark, the dark fringe. Now, being a little bit offset, uh, you get a little bit of signal, so you get a little bit of shot noise. Since this is a quantum effect, you have a Heisenberg principle, right? So uh, the fluctuations in amplitude times the fluctuations in frequency, they have to be larger than h bar over four, uh, two, I don't remember. Um, so what you can do, here you are interested mainly in measuring the phase of the light, right? The light is going to two arms, comes back, and then if there is a gravitational phase wave, it will put, it will give you a phase difference. Now you want to rem lower the fluctuations in phase, right? Now you can do that by injecting into the interferometer some light with par uh, special characteristics that lower the uncertainty in phase. Of course, the Einstein principle still is still there, so you have to lower the fluctuations in amplitude, right? But the fluctuations in amplitude are anyway, are in a, a low frequency, so they are below the noise, the seismic noise that you have 
already in the interferometer, so you don't care too much about those, right? So you can reduce the, reduce the phase uncertainty. You will increase the, uh, the uncertainties in amplitude. You don't care about that. But you can gain sensitivity at higher frequencies, which is what we are interested in. And the way you do it is with an, you use a nonlinear crystal and you inject the modes right into, uh, into the output of the interferometer to do, to do that. So uh, there is, a, a, again, a lot of research going on. The idea is, uh, is simple, but then uh, do it in practice on the scales of this interferometer is, uh, is very complicated. Okay, so I think I have to move a little bit faster. So I like to because we have seen only the first box, <laughs> right, of that pipeline. So let's move on. So the second thing that you have to be very careful is how to calibrate this thing. Because from the output on the interferometer, you essentially you count photons, right? But uh, uh, people doing astrophysics, they want a strain, right? They want H. So how do you go from counting photons to measuring the strain. So you had to calibrate the instrument, convert the output into, uh, into H. And you have to do it by avoiding uh, both uh, systematic effects and, uh, uh, and uh, uncertainties. So as I said before, you, first of all, you have to control this, right? So what you measure is uh, the uh, reaction that you don't measure directly the effect of the gravitational waves, but the correction that you have to input in the interferometer to keep everything stable. So uh, this is a scheme of the uh, uh, control loop of the interferometer. And then you need to calibrate it, right? So you need to say, OK, how many photons corresponds to a strain of 10 to the minus 21? The way you do this is, uh, um, well, first of all, you have a calibration pipeline, which is uh, modeled based on the interferometer. But then you have to compute what are the systematic uh, effects. How do you do that? Well, the idea is neat. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really incredible. You do it with a photon calibrator. Okay? So you have uh, a laser. You sh shine it uh, on the test mass. That's the you know, simple idea. And then you know how much uh, uh, light you, are, uh, you send. You can compute what's the force due to the radiation pressure, right? And, and then, given, uh, given the force that you know you apply, you can measure what is the effect on the interferometer, and you calibrate it, right? So this is called a photon, uh, a photon calibrator. So, you measure essentially the radiation pressure and use that information since you know uh, what is your input to measure the final displacement. In first approximations, these are free masses, right? So the calculation is uh, relatively simple. Of course, things are not as simple as they look at because you need to make sure that the system is calibrating properly. Right? So for example, you have the test mass. On the test mass, you have the beam. That in general, the beam is not at the center, is, is off. And then you have to shine uh, the laser of the photon calibrator. But you have to be careful that it does not deform the mirror. So what you do is to shine it in two different places. You have to make sure that it's uh, stable. You need to make sure that you inject, uh, uh, that it, what's inside, what you inject is essentially what, what you are controlling. Everything has to be in vacuum. So. And so this is at the same time as you're taking data or? No. Uh, that's separate, right? Uh, so every, every week, so let me just show you a couple of pictures, right? Uh, of the NTS mass with, uh, uh, with the calibration. So every week, we do what they are called uh, calibration sweeps. So for half an hour every week, right? We don't take data that, at that point, but we inject, uh, you know, the, um, we inject the calibration light. 
at a certain frequency and we measure the effects and that we calibrate, right? Of course, that we don't calibrate it all the time because you don't want to, to have the signal injected all the time. So we do, we do it, uh, uh, you know, once a week. And then, of course, we assume that in between uh, everything remains, uh, uh, remains stable. At the end of each run, then there, there are measurements at the beginning of the run, and then there are post-mortem measurements at the end of the run to make sure because uh, uh, the instrument is changing across, uh, you know, several months uh, like that. Um, yeah. So at this point, you're able to inject an arbitrary thing, basically, into the system, right? Yeah. Why don't you do the separate dining thing, where you inject a certain uh, specific frequency to separate more the frequencies near that frequency from frequencies which are far from that frequency? Um, can you say it again? So, if, if, you know, if you, if you take sine of omega t, yeah. and you add to it sine of alpha t, mm -hmm. That you get out sine of alpha plus. Yeah, we, we do that. We do that. We do that. You, we modulate that. That's that's for example how we, how we lock or those kind of things. Oh, yeah, wow. we do. Yeah. You do it with, by injecting the signal. Yeah, there is. Uh, I haven't said that there is another laser, which is a green laser, which is uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so for example, when you look at the sensitivity, uh, la, la, the sensitivity plot. Some of these lines are calibration lines, right? Are lines that are injected on purpose to calibrate the instrument. And, uh, um, right, so I don't remember the frequency, but they, they are those lines there. Okay. Um, now, the end product, and this is amazing, is that in the last science run, we were able to calibrate the instrument with less than 1% systematic error, right? So essentially, this curve here has an uncertainty of less than 1%, which I really think is, is something amazing. Um, okay. How much better was that than we didn't know what? Uh, factor two or three, I think, or something, something like that, yeah. And that's, uh, that's very important, right? Because uh, um, if, if you have a gravitational wave signal, right, and you don't calibrate the, the, the strain well, you, as you know, the distance of a source is proportional, you know, inversely proportional to the strain. So if, for example, if you want to um, compute, estimate uh, the Hubble constant, right, that the distance is very important and you need you know, you need to have these things calibrated very well. Okay, so that's the main instrument, of course, full of sensors, right? So we have a website which is called the uh, Channel Information System. You can go there, right, and see all the channels uh, that, uh, all the outputs of the interferometer. Uh, each of these outputs are time series sample at different frequencies, right, from a few hertz to uh, 32 uh, kilohertz, I think. And uh, if you look at them, the, that number is 400,000, right? So there are about 200,000 channels per instrument, right? Some of them are for the environment, some are for them are for, uh, of them are for control and so on. We use a restricted number of these channels to do data quality, right? So not all these channels are eventually important to really look, uh, look at the data, but each, each sensor has a channel uh, coming out. Um, we call these auxiliary, auxiliary channels. Um, all right, so we even have a, com a convention, right, which dates for uh, a long time, and the convention is like that, so the first uh, two letters are for the site. Then you have which system is, which subsystem, where it's located, what kind of signal you have, what kind of subsignal if you have it. So, for example, this channel here, right, is in Livingstone. Is the system is a suspension? Is the suspension that we saw before? The subsystem is the input test mass mass of the X arm, and uh, then it's uh, a channel that is used for online for detector characterization. 
and uh, it's it recorded by the data acquisition system, right? Uh, and uh, and you can use it for you know data quality. Okay, so you had to learn a little bit all these things, and I don't know all of them honestly, but uh, now I have a quiz for you. Where is this? Hanford. Can you guess what is this? Is the pre-stabilized laser, right? Okay. So, for example, this is a this is a channel that looks at the pre-stabilized lasers and so on. And we have uh, thousands of them, right? So, as I said, they are all time series, right? At different uh, data rates, they have different units. They can uh, be acquired in different ways. One important thing is that. Uh, uh, some of them are safe, some of them are unsafe for, for data quality. What does it mean? For example, if channels from the output mod cleaner, they are generally unsafe because you can have already the signal there. So you cannot use it to veto uh, uh, some, some noise. And, uh, and one of the questions is how really do you explain Explore all these 200,000 time series, right? And here is where probably machine learning will be uh, very, very useful in, in the future. So you will hear more from, uh, from Antonio. Uh, now, if you want to play a little bit with, uh, with the data yourself, the uh, Open Science Center, uh, LIGO Open Science Center, has released three hours of uh, auxiliary channel uh, data. So, for example, you can go there and plot the time series and see if there are glitches or not, do you spectrograms and so on, it's very useful. And especially if you want to test some algorithms that you have, for example, machine learning, this is a, a good way to, um, to look at it. Do you have a useful signal embedded in it? Or? These are auxiliary channels. Oh, only so, channels. Yeah. So, they, these don't have, yeah. Uh, what, do, what do you mean in the channel name? When you put the, the side, by the detector, and what do you mean by the side? Like the, the laser comes from this place of the... No, laser. Hanford or Livingstone, one of the... But, but then, like the, uh, what do you say before, like the resulting mirror or something like that? Yeah. What do you mean by that, in the channel name? Oh, it means that the sensor is uh, at that at the location of, for example, of the N-test mirror, right? So, for example, uh, you could uh, you could have a seismometer there, right? The uh, ground seismometer. It has you know uh, three degrees of freedom. So each of these degrees of freedom has a channel, right? So for example, you can have in Hanford the seismometer located at the interferometer vertex on the ground of certain kind, degree of freedom uh, X, uh, acquired online, and all these kind of things. Um, okay, now, fighting the noise, right? Detector characterization data, uh, data quality. All sort of noise you have in the interferometer, quantum noise, suspension noise, thermal noise, gravity, uh, uh, gravity gradient noise, right? Um, a cloud passes by, is more massive, and you, you can feel it. Um, anthropogenic noise, weather, right? We, you can measure wind, you can measure seismic activity, electronic or mechanical noise, all these kind of things, right? There are in general two kinds of noise in broader sense. One is short-lived, and we call them glitches or transient noise. And then you have some persistent noise, right? For example, the 60 hertz line is there and is persistent because you have to keep uh, the switch on for, uh, for the laser. The persistent noise creates spectral lines, right? So things that uh, are particularly annoying for people looking for um, continuous waves from, from neutron stars. Glitches are particularly annoying for people looking for uh, short transients. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm going to skip it, uh, skip this, uh, because I'm really running late. But um, the message here is that LIGO noise is not Gaussian, is not stationary. 
So you can uh, develop all your algorithms right under that assumption, and that's good to test, but I saw in the past many things that uh, work very well when you use Gaussian noise and stationary and fail miserably on the real data because you have all sorts of linearities and so on. We're about five minutes late, just, just so that you know. So I'm running late already. Oh, we are starting. We started about five minutes late. So oh, okay. But you have to wave at me and tell me uh, uh, to stop because otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll talk forever. Um, anyway, I'll be here for the next three months. So. Um, okay, so uh, so one thing is to you know get the raw channel, and one thing is get the information from the final product, right? So in general, at least in first approximation, if you are interested just in short transients, right? In first approximation, if you are just looking at a minute or date or so on, the interferometer is essentially stationary, right? And the Noise is not Gaussian, but uh, but doesn't change too much with time. So what you can do is to first of all you band pass the signal to eliminate the frequencies that you you don't care, and then you can whiten it. You can evaluate the uh, the the PSD, the the um, uh, power spectral density around that time, and you whiten it with that, and you you do a good job. So for example, this is the raw time series, 10 seconds of the first detection six years ago, and then uh, I used three, four lines of Python, I band passed it, uh, I whitened it, uh, I went back to, to the time domain, and there he is, there you have the chart, right? Now, the complicated thing is uh, what you do with, uh, after you have the, the, the chart, because you have to uh, get the physical information from there. But again, keep in mind that everything is in general non-stationary, non-Gaussian, right? And uh, we have uh, some of the glitches, some of the transients, we have auxiliary channels that we can use to witness them. Some of them, we don't. For example, this is, this is what we call the blip glitch, right? It's a very short, it happens uh, about maybe every minute or every few minutes, right? And as far as we know, is not witnessed by any of those channels. Now, we are not looking at all 200,000 channels. We look at the subset. So it's well possible that one or, uh, I mean, that there is some channel that is going to witness it, and we haven't caught it yet. It's well possible that these are noise that is not explained, that we don't know how to explain or model, or, you know, it could be, you know, one bad, uh, uh, tr diode uh, in, uh, in some subsystem that, uh, you know, we, we don't know that creates these kind of things, right? But there are, uh, there are these kind of problems, noise that is not explained. So, for example, if you are interested in doing uh, noise studies, uh, if you want to eliminate this kind of noise, you have to rely on, on the main channel of the interferometer, which is very dangerous, right? Because, uh, uh, is this really noise or, or is uh, ET who is trying to tell me something by sending a signal to one interferometer? I don't know. You have to be careful. When you're looking for things that are not modeled uh, and you use the output of the instrument to veto those kind of things, so you have to be careful. You don't want to repeat what people, the first discoverer of white dwarfs did, right? That the at the HR diagram, and then there was this star that was off and said, I'll throw it away because it makes no sense. It was the first white one. I'm curious, the, the noise glitches are similar for the two instruments, or, or there are ones which are unique to an instrument? There are some that are unique and some that are different. Uh, there are some that are unique and some that are different. Depends what's, what's the origin, right? And that's another complication, right? Because in principle, the two LIGO interferometers, they should exactly be the same, but they, they are actually not. Um, okay, um, let's, so, but if you have some witness channels, right, you can use it to do some data quality. So for example, the first channel there is the calibrated strain. Right, so you have uh, the, the series, this noise is series, and then at zero you have a spike, that's a glitch, right? And if you, 
you look, you come, you look at these channels and you see that some of them, they are related and some show the same glitch, some of them don't, right? So for example, this one is a physical environment monitor of the, at the end of the Y arm and it's a magnetometer hosted in the eBay rack, right? Of the quadruple suspension and it doesn't show anything. Right? Uh, this one, which is the alignment sensing control of the X arm, the transmitted light, and blah, 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 it shows something like this, right? So if you know, if you know that the channel is safe, you can use that to eliminate your, your noise. Um, okay, so what we do is to create what we call data quality flags, right? Uh, if we know that something is bad in the data, we flag it. And we can flag it according to different categories, depending if you really have to junk the data or not, right? Because sometimes, for example, you have disturbances that uh, are a different frequency than the frequency band of the signal you're looking at, right? So you can still use the, use the data. Sometimes you have to throw things away, right? Most important thing you need to be uh, make sure that this is safe, so you are not throwing away, away real signals. And we use some metrics, right? You don't want to throw away too uh, much data, right? Because in principle, if I, if I veto everything, I'm fine. I don't have any noise. Also, I don't have any data, right? On the other hand, yeah. <coughs> Your definitions, there's two definitions of safety in use, right? That, that definition on this slide is like a statistical definition of safety, whereas earlier you're talking about whether a channel is physically... That's right, that's right, because... That's right, there are two meanings. That's, that's a very good point, because there are some channels that are unsafe because uh, if you have a gravitational wave, it will show up there, so you don't use that, right? On the other hand, there are some safety metrics that are statistical, right? Because... Uh, uh, essentially, you count how many coincid uh, accidental coincidences th there are, right? And if something glitches, uh, you see that glitches more than the random, what, what you spec randomly, that means that even if you don't, uh, don't explain the correlation, there is a correlation there. Yeah, that's a very good point. And uh, so it's always a trade-off between that time, right? and efficiency. So you have to maximize the efficiency and you, have, you want to minimize the dead time because you have more data. And, uh, uh, and the efficiency, the ratio between efficiency and dead time is what tells you if, uh, you know, uh, statistically, if you can, uh, um, if your channel is, okay. So the middle of the process and then at this point you have your data that are sufficiently clean enough and you can go and do your search only at this point. So I'm not going to go through this because there will be other tutorials about this, right? But essentially what you do is uh, you take your data, you condition them at this point, but uh, that you do match filtering, different uh, stages and different ways of doing match filtering, or you do simply cross correlation between detectors if you're looking at model signals. You create triggers, right? That, and then you try to identify in those triggers the signal. And of course, you have, you don't have only a trigger when you have the gravitational wave signals, but you have triggers all the time, right? These things glitch, glitch all the time. When you identify a potential candidate, what you have to do is the event validation, okay? And this is another painful um, experience <laughs> for those who have, who have done it. Because as we saw yesterday, you want to do it relatively quickly, especially, yeah, no, okay. Uh, you want to do it relatively quickly, right? But you have to be careful and you have to be, uh, you have to be safe. So for example, when we're, uh, taking data, we're during the science run, and the pipelines, they give you this possible candidate, possible trigger, no matter what time is, there is, you know, a rot of people who get 
together and try to decide based on some metrics, right, to give the go for, for a public notice or not, right? So, uh, for example, this event here that I don't remember which one was, was passed. Some of these are automatic, automatic, uh, automated, some of these are human decisions, right? The data quality was okay, it was ready to go. The advocate, which is the person uh, on the rapid response team, is to say it's okay, everything seems, seems okay. The sky map was produced, the probability that it's an astrophysical event was produced, and so on. Go ahead and send, uh, send the notice. And again, it's a very complicated process, right? So there are parts that are made by machines, parts that are require human intervention. And this is again where machine learning could become important, right? To try to make this thing uh, as fast and as uh, human independent as, as possible. Because, yeah. That's another question, I'm sorry. But, uh, the, what, there's always people, that we have enormous pressure to get humans out of the loop, right? Yes. Automated, automated. So why are humans making decisions? Do you, do you know, as I don't remember, how many times in O3, say, was a signal that the extent that we have all of our automated checks would have gone out, but humans stopped it because they identified inequality. There were uh, there were a few. I I think about ten percent or something like that. Well, a few were retracted, so they went through even <laughs> even with humans, right? Um, yeah, probably would have been much worse, right? For example, we have some machine learning that is looking at the data quality, tries to do correlation of all these channels on the fly. And uh, every time I look at that, it, I, I wouldn't trust, I wouldn't trust there. So I think we are still very far away from a, uh, from a system that, uh, you know, from that small robot, that, 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 those kind of things. Because, for example, this is a list of things that you have to look at, right? But uh, look at this, for example. Was, so this, for example, is easy to automatize, right? Our environmental monitors are active near the candidate, right? So in principle, you have, you have a machine looks at the output of the seismometers and tells you if there is an earthquake or not, or there are some disturbances, right? But then look at this question here. Was the detector in a nominal state? What does it mean? Because that thing is glitching all the time, right? So it means that it is locked. Well, obviously it's locked because I am getting data, right? I can measure what's the noise floor, and it's okay. I say it's noise is quiet. But even, even is it stationary? I don't know, because it could have been stationary until a minute ago, and now something may have happened, right? So it, this is, even the question here is, is very complicated. What is the definition of a nominal state, right? So we are a long way to, uh, from, from making this completely automatic. You have maybe about five minutes. Of five minutes, okay. I'll, uh, I'll try, to, uh, try to go, yeah, to wrap up. That's the on, and that's the online process, right? Then there is the whole offline event validation. When you have to do the catalog, uh, you spend uh, literally months, right, looking at all these events, and now we start having a lot of events. Uh, sometimes you have things like this, you need to subtract the noise. Sometimes you can subtract it, sometimes you cannot subtract it, right? Uh, there are different techniques. How do you subtract it, right? Because, for example, in principle, this signal here, the, B, the, the binary neutral star, first binary neutral star, is that's co a coherent signal between detectors, right? And this obviously is not. It's a glitch that happened in, in living. So, so in principle, it's relative. I mean, it should be straightforward to eliminate them. You eliminate the non-correlated part or not. But in doing that, you already have an assumption that uh, you know what is the correlated signal. Now, suppose you want to see for some effects that uh, they may be there, alternative gravity, if you are a fan of that, or something like that. If you don't know what is the effect, how can you remove the, I mean, leave the correlated part, so. Uh, and also, it's always risky just to use the output of the interferometer, so the channel that you use for, for the measurement to, you know, to clean up the data. 
If you do that, and we do that all the time, then uh, you can unleash uh, your, uh, uh, the, the people doing parameter estimation, right? And I'm not going to talk about this because this is all another business, but then once uh, you have the signal which is cleaned, you can try to match it to, uh, to, uh, to the physics. And uh, uh, mainly, is here's where statisticians uh, enter into play. Do you do parameter estimation? You try to evaluate the parameters. OK. And finally, at this point, uh, you have the final catalog, right? So uh, there is a lot in the process, right? Even before reaching the stage of uh, uh, you know, being able to check if there is an effect or to measure in the masses, right? So that abstract, which is uh, uh, 20 lines, right, has uh, months and years of work beneath. Um, since we started with the you know, first detection, which was six years ago, uh, don't remember exactly, but the first paper was uh, uh, maybe six pages long, eight pages long. It was a PRL, right? They allowed us to go a little bit over, right? I remember at that time, my contribution, the contribution of my, my, my students, right, was is maybe one line and a half of that paper, two columns, right? <laughs> so. Uh, it took us uh, weeks and weeks just to make sure that the noise level, the, earth, the, the seismic level, was OK. Right? Because then you start freaking out a little bit before, right? a few minutes before, or a few minutes after, I don't remember, there was a small earthquake. Oh boy, what, are we sure that it's not, the noise is not leaking at that point, and those kind of things. So there is a lot of things going on. And uh, we'll have tutorial, right? A tutorial on the parameter estimation part, which is extremely interesting, and that's, that's where part of the fun is. So this is the end of my tutorial. I'll leave you with uh, a quote, so be nice and avoid eating fat. Okay, all right.